Professor Christine Schenken's new book, uh, Women, Peace and Security in International Law, which will be out soon from Cambridge University Press. Um, it's, it's really exciting to be here in Zoom world with what Twitter immediately greeted as an all-star lineup um, and participants uh, tune in from so many different parts of the world. Um, as another tweet said, it really just doesn't get any better than this. Um, my name is Karen Knopp. I teach at the University of Toronto and I'm currently the ERCO visiting professor at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies um, at University of Helsinki. Um, I'm going to be moderating today's session together with Professor Grania de Berka, who is the Florence Ellenwood Allen Professor of Law at NYU and Faculty Director of the Hauser Global Law School. Today's event is co-sponsored by the NYU Institute for International Law and Justice and the University of Helsinki's Eric Kastrand Institute of International Law and Human Rights together with LSE's Center for Women, Peace and Security. Um, let me begin with a few words uh, about Christine and her terrific new book. Um, so Christine is an emerita professor of international law, a professorial research fellow, and the founding director of the Center for Women, Peace and Security at the London School of Economics. And she's also an L. Bates Lee Global Professor of Law at the University of Michigan. She's a fellow of the British Academy, She's a recipient of the American Society of International Law's Goler T. Butcher Medal and uh, a companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. Um, Women, Peace and Security in International Law is based on the Louder Pact lectures that Christine delivered at the University of Cambridge in 2016. Um, and as those of you who are international lawyers will know, an invitation to give the Louder Pact lectures is among the very highest honors for an international lawyer. Um, and many of the Lauterpacht lectures go on to be highly influential as books, and I'm sure that Christine's will be as well. So for the lecture's original international law audience, um, who are probably familiar with women, peace, and security as an institutionalized political agenda associated with the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, the bold new move um, at the heart of Christine's book um, is to argue that women, peace and security should be treated as a subject of international law. And uh, for people who are interested in WPS in pacifism in feminism um, and related issues, um, equally important will be the book's contribution uh, to assessing WPS including from the perspective of international law's own history of feminist pacifism um, and feminist critique. Um, so our diverse group of commentators today testifies to just how many different dimensions there are to Christine's book. And we've asked each commentator to speak uh, for five minutes about the contribution of the book from their vantage point and to end with a question inspired by the book. So Christine will then respond and we'll open it up to discussion among the speakers, and then we will open it up to questions from the chat. So if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat. Grania will be mo uh, monitoring um, and moderating that part of discussion. Um, and we'd also invite you to type in comments and greetings for Christine, because we'll have a record of the chat, um, which she'll be able to read uh, later as well. Um, and I'll give each speaker uh, notice when there's one minute to go. Now, I think our speakers like Christine truly need no introduction, but let me just say a little bit about each of them. Our first speaker will be Professor Hilary Charlesworth, who is a Melbourne Laureate Professor at Melbourne Law School and a distinguished professor at uh, the Australian National University and co-author with Christine of the classic uh, book, Boundaries of International Law, a Feminist Analysis. Next will be Radhika Kumaraswamy, uh, who is a world leader in women, peace and security former UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, um, and a former chairperson of the Sri Lankan Human Rights Commission. Third will be Professor Ayal Benvenisti, who's the Ewell Professor of International Law at the University of Cambridge and director of their Lauterpacht Center for International Law, and especially highly recognized for his work on global governance and theories of sovereignty. Fourth, will be Professor Mary Calder, who's a professor of global governance and director of the Conflict and Civil Society Research Unit um, in LSE's uh, Department of International Development, 
and the author of Influential Work on New Wars versus Old Wars. Uh, then will be Professor Monica Hakimi, who's the Associate Dean for Faculty and Research and the James B. Campbell Professor of Law at the University of Michigan. And most recently, the author of a must read article on rethinking customary international law, uh, which was a subject of a very lively online symposium on Opinio Juris. Our final speaker will be Kena Yoshida, who's a research officer at LSC's Center for Women, Peace and Security, um, and a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers, where she's also part of their international team. And Kena's innovative gender analysis of peace and security and international law brings together violence against women and structural inequalities uh, with the environment, uh, nature, and sustainable development goals. Um, so with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Hillary. Many thanks, Karen. And I just want to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation uh, here in Australia, the original owners of the land here. Well, it's a huge pleasure. I feel, um, even though it's very late at night, I feel very um, energized by being in this virtual company to participate in this worldwide launch of Christine's new book. And I really want to thank Gronja de Berke and Karen Knopp for organizing this wonderful occasion. Well, the uh, Women, Peace and Security Agenda inaugurated by Security Council Resolution 1325 in 2000, it's reached 20 years, has generated a huge literature. And I noted that it even has its own now Oxford handbook. Uh, although those handbooks are getting so specific, perhaps that's not a particular qualification these days, but it is in such a context, we might wonder if there's anything more to be said about the agenda. Uh, Christine notes in her book that the academic interest has largely come from the disciplines of international relations and also peace studies. And she also notes how few international lawyers have shown interest in the field of women, peace and security. And as Karen has already mentioned, I think the, the keen originality of the book is to consider the women, peace and security agenda from a resolutely international legal perspective, certainly countering the tendency in the literature, but also politically among some of the permanent members of the Security Council, uh, which present it as a purely political project. So in making this move, I think Christine not only sheds light on the agenda in itself, but to me, in a really interesting way, she illuminates the evolution of modern international lawmaking generally. For example, in the book, Christine suggests that the development of the so-called WPS agenda, so it has its own acronym, it's an archetype of more fluid forms of international lawmaking. It's, she says, possibly it could be understood as a specialised legal regime that emerges, and these are her words, from the informal activities of lawyers, diplomats, pressure groups, shifts in legal culture, and in response to practical needs, rather than through conscious acts of regime creation. So the book has all the hallmarks of Christine scholarship. It's meticulous, it's thoughtful, it's considered, but it's also imaginative and passionate, animated by a strong sense of justice. The book's many insights reflect the span of Christine's remarkable career. As a brilliant academic, as an admired practitioner of international law and international courts and institutions, and also as a tireless contributor to civil society projects. In the past week, against the backdrop of women's marches in both Australia and the United Kingdom, protesting about violence against women in every sphere of activity, I've been thinking as I've been going back to Christine's book about the relevance of her analysis to our current situation and the impoverished understandings of women, peace and security that operate in national politics. Christine makes the important observation that the national action plans, the women, peace and security national action plans of countries such as the United Kingdom, the United States, and I must say the same is absolutely true of that of Australia, present women, peace and security 
as essentially a foreign policy issue with no domestic relevance. By contrast, Christine points out, uh, she takes one example, I think she gives the example of both Nepal and Afghanistan, but Afghanistan's National Action Plan deals with women's participation in national politics and in national peace and security efforts, in elections, in the national judiciary, and in access to education. So one general question I, I want to pose to Christine is the effectiveness, her assessment of the effectiveness of national action plans in implementing the women, peace and security agenda. Well, we've been allocated, as Karen has reminded us, precisely five minutes each to talk tonight. And I, think I've used minute. Up, I think I've used up all of them. So I want to end with one larger puzzle that I was pondering while reading the book. Uh, and perhaps this is something that the panel could consider and all of you. In the book, Christine intriguingly describes herself uh, twice. She, she's a very modest person, as we all know, but she twice refers to herself as both a feminist international lawyer and also a traditionalist international lawyer. So one question that occurred to me, um, I've really been wondering how those two roles fit together. What are the hallmarks of each identity? And is it possible to be both at the same time? So back to you, Karen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hilary. Um, Radhika. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank Rania de Boca for inviting me to speak here today. Anything Christine writes is an iconic work, uh, beginning with the boundaries of international law that she wrote with Hilary Charles' work. She has constantly analyzed international law from a feminist lens. Her skill as a legal academic, combined with her passionate concern for the issues, makes her work both scholarly and relevant at the same time. What she does in this volume is to make the case for women, peace, and security as a specialized area of international law. Her chapter on the Security Council resolutions and women, peace, and security will be the go-to reference for anyone doing legal analysis in this area. Her argument that we are at a Groschen moment of international law with recent developments in women, peace and security is particularly compelling. I think Christine's argument and mission is an important one. I think we must consolidate, as she suggests, the gains and strengths that have resulted from the Security Council process in 1325 the four areas covered by the Security Council of prevention, protection, participation in post-conflict re recon reconstruction are the pillars on which the understanding of women, peace and security should be based. The important framework for dealing with sexual violence and conflict, the many initiatives to ensure women's representation in peace processes and conflict related institutions and very recent efforts to develop a more holistic understanding and preventive framework must be welcomed. And yet, the narrative of the Security Council on Women, Peace and Security has led to a whole host of writing and discussion from the Global South that complicate, nuance, and at times challenge the global narrative. A recent publication by Dawn called The Political Economy of Conflict and Violence Against Women for example, attempts to frame some of these issues in a different light. For example, the authors worry that sexual violence is treated as an exceptional act and not part of a continuum of violence against women, pre-war, during, and post-war. They're concerned that advocacy for women's representation is also complicated, seeking, as they say, women's decision-making in structures of the existing frames of war and oppressive systems of power. For this, the many efforts to include women in military forces in the Global South do raise uneasy questions. One of the main purposes of the volume by Dawn is to point out the importance of the local and the intersectional, the diversity around women, peace and security as a lived experience for many around the world. Unless the local becomes the centerpiece of the women, peace and security agenda, it will not move forward. The authors argue that while economic and political frameworks and practice present in the current discourse emphasize the individual entrepreneur and individual non-governmental organizations, the political economy of a war zone, which is rarely commented upon, 
actually overdetermines much of what happens to, to the women concerned. To move forward, the political economy must be part of the conversation. Christine is one of the few thinkers who is constantly attempting to bridge this gap between the Security Council narrative and the dissident voices from the Global South. In her chapter on the concept of women, she points out that the council does not differentiate among diverse situations of women or recognize the impact of multiple and intersecting discriminations. Refusal to make this a part of its analysis leads to universal templates that sometimes seem impossible to apply. Central to Christine's thinking is a reimagining re of international law through a radical engagement with the idea of peace not only as an absence of war, but also the enjoyment of economics and social justice and the entire range of human rights and fundamental rights. As a part of the radical engagement throughout her life and in this volume, she also radically reconceptualizes security as not only relegated to state security, but as individual uh, rights as well. She argues the WPS does nothing to challenge the neoliberal economic agenda that has driven post-conflict reconstruction, but that often undermines the security of women, focus, uh, women focusing on self-reliance and low skill livelihoods such as reconstruction, despite success stories, often leave women in debt. Finally, if I can have the last paragraph. Christine in this volume consolidates the gains of the Security Council resolutions, and she wants it framed in international law. I am still uncertain of that. I think she has opened also the discussion of the future. We need to foreground the local and to bring a political and economic analysis. She acknowledges that this may require a different framing of the issues to deal with emerging concerns. In this way, the volume is about the past, but also about the future. But we must ask ourselves, should that future be in the Security Council and should that future be with law? Thank you. Thank you so much, Al. Thank you very much. Um, I had the pleasure of attending Christine's lectures on this topic as part of her 2016 Hirsch Lauterpott Memorial Lectures here in Cambridge. And therefore I was delighted to see the project culminating in such a thoughtful and inspiring book. I fully subscribe to the praise for the book expressed by uh, the previous speakers. I think the case for women, peace and security is compelling as it is important. It is also an invitation and an opportunity to reflect on the way or ways forward. And in this context, um, toward the end of uh, the book, uh, Christine raises the old strategic dilemma. Uh, and let me quote, do we continue to fight for the enhancement of the lives of women and other marginalized by the state-centered imperialistic and flawed processes and structures of international law and institutions? Or do we recognize that this can never amount to more than tinkering around the edges and celebrate small gains? Um, so I would invite you to say more about this dilemma and uh, your views about uh, preferred strategies or, uh, for action, and particularly about uh, the alternatives. Uh, and uh, here, let me tie it with uh, an observation uh, that, uh, that you make uh, later um, in, in the book. If, uh, the, if the goal uh, of the, this uh, uh, um, inclusion of women in peace and uh, security and, and, uh, and peacemaking um, through international law. If the goal is to affect change uh, uh, in uh, communities, then perhaps grassroots empowerment might be more effective than top-down intervention of international law and institutions in domestic processes. Um, and what can we expect from, uh, from such UN resolutions um, uh, in this uh, more uh, uh, socially constructed uh, field. Um, and perhaps 
we don't have to think too much about traditional implementation tools uh, if, uh, if this is the way we understand the problem. So I think um, uh, I would like to uh, learn from you uh, and following uh, the book about the, um, what you think are the um, underlying uh, reasons for what you mentioned as the correlation between women participants and the success of peace negotiations. What, what is the, the reason for this, this correlation? Why women are important uh, as peacemakers? Uh, so um, there is a, there is lit, uh, uh, literature that suggests that uh, there is robust relationship indeed between peace agreements uh, with women's signatories uh, and peace durability. Um, and the question is why? And I think one answer that you give uh, is that women's priorities are strikingly consistent and more visionary. Um, there is another observation that um, there are in peacemaking, uh, mediation in, in general, there's then there's, um, mediators need to have uh, crucial tools of empathy, seeking to transform relations, build trust rather than striking a deal, uh, tools that women are more likely uh, than men to bring to the table. If these are the uh, assumptions, then perhaps top-down enforcement of the duty to include women will do the trick. But if the uh, the, the, the rationale, the, the explanation is different. The explanation would be, as others have said, that, and I quote uh, from Professor Gizeli's uh, uh, article, uh, a, possible a possible mechanism that explains this empirical observation is a different quality of the institutions and ways of handling social conflict that emerge in gender, gender equal society. In other words, gender equal societies tend to have fewer conflicts, both internally and externally, which means that, uh, that it is not uh, the women representatives that uh, make the difference, but the fact that the, they represent societies that are more uh, gender equal. And if this is the case, then a successful strategy of uh, the women, peace and security would be uh, to focus more on grassroots empowerment with international law serving as a focal point, perhaps an inspiration, but not a fiat to be uh, implemented. So uh, here are the, the questions I, I put, have to you. And thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss your important work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, Mary. Well, I follow on very well from what was just said because my starting point really is Christine's pessimism at the end of the book, where she says that the problem with the women, peace and security agenda is that it was located in the Security Council, which is geopolitical, imperialistic and patriarchal, and therefore presents an inherent structural obstacle to the implementation of the agenda. Um, and as I tend to be a slightly more optimistic person, <laughs> uh, my uh, question to Christine, which I'll put at the end, but what I really want to talk about is, you know, whether this is right and when, or whether, in fact, its location in the Security Council offers us an opportunity. Um, what I really loved about Christine's book is that it gives us a kind of conceptual trajectory of the women, peace and security agenda. So it starts in 1915 with the women's the conference in The Hague, uh, which was really centered around a fairly old fashioned concept of peace as peace being about the absence of interstate war. But it goes through the post-war period with the emergence of the human rights agenda and a much more holistic concept of peace. And thinking about it, I, what I realize is that the women, peace and security agenda was very much an outcome 
of the post-68 social movements. These were movements concerned with human rights, with peace, with women's rights, with envir the environment. And I think their big moment, their coming of age moment, was the end of the Cold War in 1989 and the end of apartheid in South Africa and the 90s, which we can look back as the happy 90s, were a period when, as it were, these movements came of age. They did become institutionalized and tamed, as Christine says. They did turn themselves into professional organizations, into international NGOs, and they did manage to succeed to get part of their agenda onto the agenda of formal states and international institutions. So we can think about the WPS agenda as alongside the human rights agenda, alongside things like the, the new discourse of human rights, civil society, humanitarianism that came out of that whole experience and a whole set of new policies that, you know, the, WP, the uh, resolution 1325 was the culmination of that. Um, other policies that, that emerged at the same time to do with human security, the landmines convention, the cluster bomb munitions, and of course, even the maybe more questionable responsibility to protect. So all of these came at the same time. And then of course, we had 2001, 9-11, and a very depressing two decades uh, with the return of geopolitics and the arise at the emergence of what I think one could call a rather sinister form of militaristic counter-terror. And of course, I think that point that Radhika made, that um, Christine, also makes, that it ignored neoliberalism. Somehow all of these new movements took social justice for granted. And it's been a really dangerous and horrible combination that we've had two, four decades of neoliberal policies along with the return of geopolitics. So what I wanted to say was, so why do I have any sense of optimism. Well, I think this COVID-19 moment is a new critical juncture. It's an existential moment like a war. And we're in the middle of it, so we can't see what's going to come out of it. But I really think that it, it just as other existential moments involve a learning process, it's going to have to involve a learning process, which will change attitudes on a lot of things. I mean, already, we see that our heroes are health and care workers rather than soldiers. And that in itself, I think, is bringing about a big change in how people think. Um, but I think one point I do want to make is that we're never going to be able to eradicate this pandemic unless we address violent conflicts in the world. Violent conflicts are places where COVID is very easily transmitted. There's a lack of health care. There are lots of crowded places like refugee camps, detention camps, where COVID spreads. There's intergenerational living. People can't afford to stay at home. And I think as long as those conflicts, those forever wars continue, then there's always going to be the risk of vaccine resistant um, uh, mutations of the virus. And actually, you know, we've seen this with polio. Polio was supposed to have been eradicated in 2005 and it's reappeared in Congo and in Afghanistan. And um, so I think actually it's going to force us to address conflicts. And I don't see how we can address conflicts without the Women, Peace and Security agenda. I mean, the conflicts are intrinsically gendered. And of course, there are lots of other policies that we need to introduce, but without, a, you know, without addressing agenda issues, we can't actually address these new 
types of conflict. So that's why I think sooner or later, the fact that we those achievements were achieved at the end of the 90s is going to be really important. And the fact that they've stayed alive, even if it's at the margins, is going to be really important in the future. So I was saying to my question to Christine, was, Christine is very, I know, is very skeptical of, about because I'm thinking about her email to me this morning about how can you um, decide to increase nuclear weapons, which is in the British Integrated Review and still promote human security. So both the Ministry of Defence and NATO have established human security units and they actually, human security, their whole human security units is a sort of bundle of things from the 90s. It's the protection of civilians, it's the protection of cultural heritage, it's the women, peace and security agenda, it's the prevention of sexual violence agenda, and it's human trafficking. And they're all bunched together in these units which are inside the Ministry of Defence and inside NATO. So does this mean that these ideas are all being put into a little corner in the margins and co-opted by these institutions? Or does it actually represent an opportunity where we can push for a very different approach towards the notion of security um, against counter-terror, against war fighting, and for the protection of people and women in particular, or, or oh, oh, no, women, men, and boys and girls, or um, which is it? And that's my question to Christine. Wonderful. Thank you, Monica. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. And Christine, congratulations on this extraordinary book. I'm really delighted to be here celebrating it. I will say that when I first heard that you did your, that Christine did her Lauderpock lectures on the WPS agenda, I was really thrilled because I had been feeling myself some guilt for not paying more attention to the WPS agenda. I knew that it existed. I had sort of been paying attention from afar, but I hadn't really um, sunk my teeth into it and, and spent time digesting it. And I think the reason that I didn't is that I wasn't sure what, like, I, I, I appreciated its, its relevance in the policy space and the way in which it had mobilized actors to pay attention to these issues. But I wasn't sure what added sort of like analytic purchase it gave to international law to have this particular frame, a frame that combined women, peace and security together. And so I thought, well, this is perfect. Uh, this obviously reflects my own limits and Christine is gonna school me on that question, which the book very much does um, in the ways that other uh, commentators have mentioned. So it really gets into and unpacks the texts of the relevant Security Council resolutions. It talks about how different uh, uh, national bodies have been established in response to the resolutions and the agenda. It talks about the, the continued mobilization and support of it. And so I really, I really, I learned quite a bit and appreciate all of that from the book. Still, I came away wondering uh, whether this frame, the women, peace and security frame is too large a frame for trying to get at all of the issues that it is trying to cover. Because as I, as I read the book, I took from, took from it the message that the women, peace and security agenda is not really just one agenda, it's multiple, somewhat overlapping, and maybe at times in tension with one another, agendas lumped into one. So there's, of course, the agenda that is about women's equality which is an agenda that is much broader than simply women's equality in the context of peace and security. It's a much bigger agenda. And of course the peace and security angle might depend on achieving equality, probably does depend on achieving equality generally and across all spaces, not just in the specific context of what we might think of as peace and security. So there's like the gender equality piece. There is the peace, P-E-A-C-E -E now, piece of the agenda, which is uh, focused on the demilitarization of global affairs. And the book nicely shows that women have been 
really instrumental in pushing a sort of pacifist agenda um, on the international plane. But this is the pacifist piece of the agenda is not entirely dependent on women, of course. Men might also be involved in that agenda. And so it's somewhat different or even if related to the agenda that focuses on achieving gender equality. And then the third I would say is the security agenda, which is focused on, and I think Christine does a really nice job of emphasizing this focus, not just establishing human security or women's security in the context of armed conflict situations, but establishing general conditions in which human security actually exists across the board. So outside of things that people think of as armed conflict situations, Christine has a really nice way. I, I told her in, separately that she has these like zingers that are a really nice way of underscoring like, yeah, sexual violence in war is a problem, but sexual violence generally is a problem and it often occurs outside wartime contexts. And so thinking about women's security only in the context of a wartime setting or a conflict-like setting, which is the setting in which the Security Council most gets involved, is too narrow a way of understanding really the security angle that is necessary to achieve the women, peace, and security agenda. So because it has these multiple agendas within it, each one of which is massive, right? Gender equality, peace, pacifism, and human security. I wonder what we gain and what we lose by having the sort of unifying frame of the women, peace and security agenda. Like whose positions does that frame put at the center of the conversation? Whose does it make more peripheral? And how does it obscure certain avenues for redress and action? Uh, perhaps by focusing too much, for example, on the Security Council and not emphasizing, for example, the opportunities of the CDOC committee or other mechanisms, grassroots mechanisms of the sort that Eyal mentioned earlier. So I, I, I continue to grapple with the question of whether this meta frame is what it does and what, it, what we get out of it and what we lose from it. So I guess that's the question that I wanna present for discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Monica. Kena. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, uh, Gronya, for having me here today. And congratulations to Christine. It's a real privilege um, to be here. And um, perhaps with my sort of early scholar hat, I'd just like to say that the contribution and importance of these types of books, I think, are to term Sarah Ahmed's, to use her term, it's like a feminist lifeline. When you're trying to do research into international law, suddenly you see works like this and you think, ah, yes, it is legitimate. Uh, yes, I can look into these sort of feminist uh, feminist questions. Um, and that is, I think, a really important uh, contribution of the book to the field. So the book asks, what is the WPS agenda? What's its content? Uh, is there such a thing as WPS law or is WPS law even a thing? Which is a pretty astounding, simple question for those of us working um, in the field of WPS. But I think it really makes us sit back and think, yes, what is this thing? What are these Security Council resolutions that then there are national action plans, but then states need to go and report to the CEDAW committee about their compliance? Um, and, uh, and that I think is what the book is about and amongst other things. So what does the book do? Well, I think one, it's indispensable to the doctrinal lawyer or the traditional doctrinal lawyer um, in that even though Christine says there's no uh, substitute for reading the resolutions, it really provides a very thorough analysis of those resolutions and unpacks them. It also, I think, is a legal opinion on the status of Security Council resolutions, weaving in the ICJ decisions uh, on that issues uh, and engaging with the work of other international scholars. It contextualizes all of this, um, as, other, as Mary just said, in the wider history of women's activism. And then for the international lawyers, I think that's very interesting because Christine uses that to talk about the place of fact-finding missions and commissions of inquiry in international law. I saw the book as a mirror, I think. In the first half of the book, I really saw it as reflections on the WPS resolutions from the point 
of an international law. So very much rooted in international law and pivoting to the WPS agenda and setting out a lot of those criticisms um, of the WPS agenda that you find in peace studies and international relations. For example, that WPS has a militarized conception of peace. Uh, that is very well known. Why is that interesting to the international lawyer? Well, Christine says, really, it has a lack of the inclusion of the disarmament agenda and all these treaties and conventions that we have on disarmament and international law. Where are they? Why are they absent? So those are the types of questions uh, we see her ask in the first part of the book. Another example she provides is on sexual and reproductive rights and the lack of explicit inclusion uh, of women's sexual and reproductive rights. Why is that when the Mampudu Protocol does recognize that, for example, and we've had case law from other international uh, bodies and courts. The second half of the book, I think, is reflections that we get from WPS that can tell us something about international law. So why is there this continuous presence and strange absence of the concept of peace from mainstream international law, Christine says. Um, and she asks questions such as, there's been less attention directed towards law generating impact of Security Council resolutions adopted under chapter six of the UN Charter than treaties that have not come into force from uh, uh, General Assembly resolutions. So really international law centered questions. Um, my question that I had for Christine from reading it all was about uh, global summits. And Christine talks about how global summits pr proliferated in the 1990s, but have fallen out of fashion as a forum for lawmaking since that time. Perhaps Security Council thematic resolutions have, to some extent, taken their place. And I find that really worrying because Christine later goes on in the book to talk about how women's priorities are strikingly consistent and are noticeably more visionary in terms of social justice and cohesion. And I think that's something that we see when we look at the Beijing declarations or some One of the minute. declarations that come out of these forums. So that's really my question for Christine. What does that mean? And if they have taken their place, well, should we get that place back again? Thank you. Thank you so much to all of, uh, of the commentators for this incredible, um, rich array of perspectives in the book. Um, and now we'll turn it over to Christine. You need to unmute Christine. Okay, that's a good start. It's always good to unmute. Um, thank you, first of all, all of you. Um, I cannot believe on the very kind, supportive, helpful comments that you've all been making. And I just feel incredibly privileged that you have all taken the time to read the book, to participate, especially Rod, looking at Radhika and Hillary at very unsocial hours um, of the day. And thank you all for these very valuable questions and comments and questions. Um, they're thought provoking. They would take a very long time for me to grapple with all of them. And I think I have five minutes. Um, so clearly I'm not going to be able to answer them. So what I thought that I would do is think about some of the themes that are common to the various questions, how they tie up to the themes in the book, and um, perhaps um, suggest, make some sort of suggestions around the questions. Before I do that, of course, the other thing I must do is thank Gronya and Karen very much for bringing together such a wonderful array of people and the work that you've put into the event, as well as Rachel and Thomas and the rest of the NYU team, and the institutes at NYU and in the University of Helsinki. So thank you all very much indeed. Um, I think what I found most striking about the comments and the questions is that though they all come from very different directions, there are common themes between them. And so that's what I want to sort of try and build on. Um, I think a feature of Women, Peace and Security, and I think this has also come through from the comments, is that it is the combination of multiple interactions from so many different players and institutions so we have feminist activists, activists and campaigners, UN institutions, government departments, particularly foreign policy, development, um, Ministry of Defense, um, sometimes also home affairs, grassroots peace builders, human rights defenders, humanitarian workers, legal practitioners, and academia sort of in general. So this vast array of different actors in the field. 
And I think speakers have also highlighted some of the many different perspectives. Monica has just said so many um, different subjects as part of international law. We've got, just to mention some, political economy, gender equality, human security, disarmament, demilitarization, violence against women's political participation. And I think it's these mix of the multiple topics and the multiple players that give rise to some of the tensions and puzzles that pervade the book and still puzzle me. And I think in international law terms, the greatest is how can there have been so much political and operational activity for so long over so many issues, a century long social movement of women's activism, um, resolutions adopted in women's congresses, in global summits on women, in the Security Council, in the human rights bodies, national action plans now concluded by well over um, 80 states, policies and programs in the military and NATO, you know, so much all over the place. And yet mainstream accounts of international law largely discount all of this activity. And is this because the words women, peace and security slip very nicely and easily off the tongue? But the actors, these players, are not the traditional actors of international law. Um, the instruments, the activities, etc., are not the traditional sources of international law. Um, is it that there is just so much, again, as has just been said, that they don't really fit together as a coherent or umbrella subject, giving rise to concrete state and institutional obligations that lawyers can you know, take account of and work with? But then this, isn't, this is true of so many areas of international law. It's not just unique to women, peace and security. So maybe women, peace and security just has too many, too many players, too many issues, perhaps simply too many women and that therefore are more easily discounted. Or maybe it's just that um, there are other regimes of international law and these issues can, are already dealt with elsewhere. We have IHL. We have international criminal law, human rights law, refugee law, etc. And since we have those, why worry about WPFs within international law? Now, of course, one response is that those other recognized legal re regimes do not put women or gender at their center. And the gains that have been made in those regimes are fairly uh, marginal, perhaps rather tenuous. The hope of those who campaigned for 1325 back in the early um, but during the 1990s was to have women and women's experiences of conflict placed at the center of the prime function of international law, the maintenance of international peace and security. Women were to be present in this space as participants and as agents of change in achieving peace and security um, within the international arena. Now the resolutions do of course purport to put women or at least some women those who are victims with special needs at the center, when they are victims of something called the tactics of war or the tactics of terror or the tactics of extremism. This correspondingly, of course, puts protectors also at the center, primarily male protectors and militaristic um, methodologies. But what also remains largely center and not uh, largely absent is the multiple contexts of women's lives, even within conflict and the many factors that together make up their experiences, their personal situations and identities, and the broader social contexts of militarism, inequalities, colonial histories, his, histories, what we might say patriarchy in total. These are not centered, therefore they remain unchallenged by the WPS agenda. Peace, as has been said by many people, remains largely unaddressed. And despite the implicit nod to human security, state security through military means remains foremost. Nor despite the rhetoric, are women in fact central participants in conflict resolution or social reconstruction? So some of the questions that people have been asking revolve around the institutions of women, peace and security, global summits or the Security Council or local actors, the value of national action plans, the meaning of human security within a militarized framework, and they all give rise to multiple responses. We can argue, for instance, that the NGO forum at a global summit meeting is part of our women's history. It, the, its widespread participation allows us to negotiate with each other, to set our own agendas, 
and provide a greater chance of bringing those agendas into the final document of the Global Summit. A Security Council resolution, in contrast, will always be subordinated to the gen agendas and language of the Permanent Five. Um, national action plans, what is the value of them? Um, and for value for whom? They can be a bridge between the international and the domestic. They may provide leverage to influence state behavior, may thus even generate state practice in international law terms. But that usefulness must always depend upon the content of the particular plan, its reflexivity, and indeed its ownership within a particular national society. Is it useful that WPS may become subsumed within a framework of human security? Or is this in fact just a way of diluting the centrality of women or of further militarizing all security? Other questions have been around the strategies feminists pursue to gain the greatest traction. And indeed, should feminists be looking to entrench women, peace and security in international law? And I think as a separate question, should we continue to look at the Security Council for progress? Now, whatever Hillary may say, I think I still am at heart, both a traditionalist international lawyer and yet retain the perhaps optimistic belief that feminist methodologies can be used to challenge the formalism of international law, can unharness its transformative potential and put peace, equality and social justice at its center. Um, and meanwhile, I think we should stick with trying to continue within international law. I don't think we should abandon international law. It has useful language, it has useful symbolism, it has um, useful coordinating power, but nor can we rely upon international law alone. And nor, of course, is the Security Council the bastion of international law, nor is it the champion of a progressive WPS agenda. Indeed, I would argue that its recent record, um, for example, on the pandemic, shows it to be a body that is shackled at present and is not providing effective leadership within the international community at all. The multiple other play players that I've been mentioning are where we need to look for the advancement of a WPS agenda. Human rights bodies, civil society, women's organizations, working at and across local, national and regional levels, listening and learning from each other, setting their own priorities, introducing, as Radhika said, new narratives and narratives that perhaps have not entered sufficiently into the agenda as currently addressed. Um, this is where we should be looking. And the internationals, the top down, should be supporting those actions, not co-opting them. And further, I think all of this needs as well to be done in a spirit of solidarity as we resist and fight against the pushbacks that we see, not just to women, peace and security, but to other agendas of social justice, economic justice. And I think just thinking back over the 20 years, I mean, I was very worried that the book got um, presented to the um, publishers just before last October, when of course there was the great idea that there was going to be a further resolution. And I thought, oh dear, it's going to be out of date even before it gets published. Of course, the, another resolution didn't happen last October. So on my part, relief. But I think sort of more broadly, we ought to see the failure of a new resolution last October, not as a failure, but rather as resistance to empty repetition of the same words and lack of progress by the Security Council and an invitation to look to these other places for the further advancement of women, peace and security. No way have I done justice to all of your comments or to your questions, but I hope I have touched upon and that we can now have more of a discussion. And thank you all again. Spectacular, everyone, thank you. I mean, this is really overwhelming and I think we can see in the comments uh, that people are really um, inspired by the discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna hand over to Grania to maybe pick up one or two strands from the chat uh, just to conclude. Great. Well, that was an amazing discussion. Thanks so much to everyone. Um, I, I've seen two questions in the chat and I have a, a sort of a question or reflection of my own, but maybe I'll just briefly mention the questions, Christine, even if there isn't time to answer them. Um, so Constantina Nuka has asked whether um, the Security Council or international law would ever be in a position to help address intersectional uh, vulnerabilities in conflicts and in peace building processes. And Juliana Santos has referred to the 
ambiguous law, non-law status of the WPS and asked whether really the legal or non-legal status really matters or not, is salient or not, um, and whether activists in the field have in any way instrumentalized that ambiguous status. And my own thought is listening to the discussion and especially to the a bit of the either or kind of critique that we heard at times where I think both Ayal and Radhika talked about, you know, don't we really need to locate this at the grassroots level and, and your own critique, Christine, of the patriarchal imperialist nature of the Security Council. And I was thinking someone whose spirit is hovering over today for me is Sally Murray. I was thinking that Sally's work on vernacularization you know, would question that dichotomy and, you know, think about creative ways in which people interested in the WPS agenda might think about how the local and the, you know, for all its faults and for all its dysfunctions and so on, the Security Council, as you said, carries certain kind of weight and status and centrality of a kind in the international stage and the grassroots level where real change and uh, actually happens and has legitimacy that the interaction between those two and the ways in which activists on the ground might make use of and vernacularize um, the outputs or the relevance of the what's coming from the Security Council might, might yield some productive um, uh, thinking. So, um, Christine, I don't know whether we, we had thought about going back to the panelists. I don't know if anyone on the panel has any further reflection in response to what Christine said. I, I might just put it out there rather than trying to go through all of you since we've only a couple of minutes left. Um, so if anyone from the panel would like to jump in at this point, or anyone else, and if not, I'll hand back to Christine to see if she has any thoughts on the two questions um, in the chat. Christine, I think it's over to you. I was hoping that everybody else would come in um, very much. Um, the can the Security Council or other bodies uh, address the intersectional um, uh, forms of discrimination and so on? Well, the first thing they've got to do is recognize it and recognize uh, they've got to move away from their unidimensional essentialist view of women and girls and of um, men and boys as well i mean very clearly the resolutions do not look in any um way at all at the multiple interactions um that um, there's occasional reference to oh yes uh, women with disabilities might have a bit more of a problem but i mean it's um very throwaway and not very helpful um i mean i think one of the things that they could do is look to the CEDAW committee and somebody raised this like you know why is there this big divide between new york and geneva if we have women peace and security surely this should be overlapping and that there should be more institutional um drawing upon and learning from each other in many ways. I'm sure Radhika must have thoughts about this given her um, experience across both, both sort of sides. And um, the, the CEDAW committee has done a great deal more on intersectional um, aspects and that the Security Council could learn about. Um, well, sort of very, very quickly, does ambiguity between law and non-law matter? Is this something that only worries lawyers? Um, of course, we all know that governments fall back on it. Oh, this is not a binding legal obligation. Therefore, I don't need to actually comply in any ways. And something that's really puzzled me recently is what's the difference between governments and undertaking commitments and saying, yes, we have made a commitment here, we're working, and yet we don't see that as being binding in any way at all. Is there something different called a commitment or an agreement? And yet that's not actually... Um, law? I'm not sure. Um, no, I don't think it should be either or. And I do think that, yes, um, activists, um, those who are working, those who are putting their bodies and lives on the line in so many ways to advance the women, peace and security. And we should never forget that it, it can be extremely dangerous for so many um, women elsewhere. All of them, I think, um, can and should be able to draw some support, at least, from the fact that this is an agenda that is mandated and approved at the highest level. Um, at the same time, of course, and as has been said by so many people, the big loss to the agenda from the work of so many women activists has been its entrenchment at the top down. Perhaps national action plans are one of the bridges that can be made between 
um, those two areas, taking the commitments from the top down, bringing them to the local, but then they cannot just be captured by states. They have to, again, be um, plans and um, works that can be used transnationally across um, state boundaries um, and give further strength to the actions um, of the different um, and multiple grassroots organizations. There's an awful lot more that could be said, but I think we really are out, aren't we, Gronya? <laughs> I think we are, Christine, um, but it's been just a, a, a sort of a sign of the incredibly rich discussion. I think we could have gone on for a lot longer. Um, I, I want to wrap up because I know people have other uh, commitments to use uh, Christine's word, but I want to point out, Christine, and I hope you'll read them later, that there are all kinds of uh, really lovely comments in the in the chat for you and all kinds of, to use Farida's term, ululations uh, and, and congratulations to you on your incredible uh, work and the influence you've had on the field and particularly on uh, your work with many of your co-authors on the panel today in um, bringing a feminist approach to international law. So I just want to conclude by thanking everyone really warmly um, who participated in today's event. Um, first of all, the participants, the panelists who read the book, who commented on it. Um, I want to thank uh, Thomas and Rachel behind the scenes for all they did. Karen for her enormous uh, efforts in really making this um, such a, a successful uh, event. And especially to Christine for all uh, she has done um, for the field and um, for, for giving us the opportunity to celebrate her, her work here today. So thank you, all of you. And as Christine said at the outset, let's hope we can meet someday in person for <laughs> too long. But in the meantime, at least we have the capacity to gather together from around the world in, in this way, which is certainly a lot better than nothing. Thank you. And thank you again. <laughs>